Uh, thanks for the introduction and for invitation to speak here. Um, so this is joint work with Ilias Diakonikolas, Elena Grigorescu and Abiram Natarajan. And as uh, uh, Amit already said, this is going to be about uh, the complexity of learning discrete distributions. So let me start from perhaps an obvious fact, especially after the previous talk where Graham talked a lot, a lot about uh, you know, discrete distributions, but discrete distributions are, are pretty common. Like whenever you have uh, um, like various samples, then um, each sample has some probability, and this defines some, some discrete distribution over the space of the samples, right? And uh, given a distribution, given access to samples to, uh, from a distribution, you might uh, want to solve multiple problems, right? Multiple kinds of problems. Like one, the simplest one perhaps is you, you might just want to learn the distribution, right? You want to have some good approximation to what this distribution is. Another example is uh, you might want to check if this distribution has some specific property, right? And uh, perhaps the simplest, uh, the simplest uh, example is, is testing if a distribution is uniform. Right? You, you have uh, some small set of items, some, uh, I mean, the support size is small, and now you get uh, uh, each element from the support with some distribution, and you want to see if, if, if this is roughly uh, uniform distribution. Right? Like another example is maybe you want to estimate some, some parameter of the distribution. Right? Uh, uh, one example could be, uh, what is the, uh, the entropy of the distribution? Right? Or if it's a distribution on some product set, then you might ask whether distribu this distribution is, is, uh, is a product of distributions or how far is it from, from, from being a product distribution. So in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on the simplest task, on the most basic task, I believe, which is uh, learning this distribution. Right? So in general, we're going to assume we have some underlying probability distribution and uh, we'll be receiving independent samples from, from this distribution. And uh, in this problem, the goal is to output a distribution, which is a good approximation to this unknown distribution. Right? So we want to output the distribution d prime, such that the L1 distance between those two distributions is at most epsilon. Epsilon is some, some parameter uh, that, we received, uh, that we receive on input. Right? And uh, what does this L1 distance mean? Well, you, you can think of uh, each distribution as a vector, right, where all the coordinates are positive, positive real numbers, and they sum up to one. Right? So the L1 distance between two distributions, you just take those two vectors, and, and you see uh, what's the, the L1 distance between them. So, so for this specific task, if uh, the support size is n, it is known that the sample complexity, the number of samples that you need to draw uh, from the distribution, uh, has to be n over epsilon square in the worst case. In this talk, I'm going to go one step farther. So this is like a well-known classical uh, 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 task. And uh, here we are going to go slightly farther. So we're going to assume that the samples are not in one place. There is no single person that, who receives all the, all the samples. Instead of that, we're going to assume that there is a number of players that, uh, that hold uh, those uh, random samples. And uh, they want to communicate in order to solve, solve the problem. Right? And now the question becomes, you know, how much do they have to communicate in order to solve uh, a specific problem we are interested in? Right? Is sublinear communication possible? And uh, for this talk, I'm going to keep it very basic. So I'm going to look at the simplest case. So I will assume that each player is going to receive one sample, right? And uh, then each player will output this, will, will send a single message to some extra player, which we're going to call uh, the referee. And this referee, based on what, uh, uh, what, what, she, what she saw, wants to output uh, a distribution that uh, is supposed to approximate well the distribution from, from which the samples came. Right, so, so each sample has uh, log n bits. Right? So, so the natural question becomes, can, can the average distribution communication be made 
less than log n. Can on average the players send less than log n information? Right? So this is going to be the main, the main question I'm, I'm going to look at uh, uh, in this talk. Right? So let me just mention that uh, uh, this question of uh, uh, communication efficient learning has been uh, quite popular lately. But like most work has been focusing on continuous problems, right? Like one example where, where people uh, made uh, quite a bit of progress is uh, you receive samples from some multidimensional Gaussian distribution. And now the question is, uh, uh, what is the, the, the mean of this distribution? Right? And we're able to show that, uh, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that it's impossible to eliminate uh, a factor of the dimension, right? Like overall, uh, there is some, uh, some required amount of uh, communication that has to happen for, for, for single dimension. And if you have multi multiple dimensions, then this communication goes up by a factor uh, which equals the number of dimensions. Okay, so, so this is the outline of the talk. So I'm going to start, uh, so this is not really going to be a communication problem, but this, this is going to uh, be a good review of some of the, the techniques that are going to be useful for uh, for this uh, survey problem that I, uh, that I mentioned. So I'm going to start from, uh, I, have a, I have a biased coin, right? And I want to estimate this bias. How many, how many uh, coin tosses do I have to make, right? And I'm going to show a simple proof that uses uh, uh, information uh, complexity. Then I'm going to look at the hard instance for, uh, for, the, for this problem of learning. If, uh, for the case when we just want to uh, uh, show a lower bound for the number of samples that we need. And then I'm going to use the same distribution for, uh, for a lower bound in the communication complexity setting. Right? I'm also going to talk about uh, some other generalizations of, of, of what you're going to see in this talk. OK, so, so let's start from this uh, warm up of a single coin. So you have this single coin, right? And we're going to toss it multiple times. And now we want to estimate the probability of, of heads, right? And the question is, how many, how, many, how many samples do we need? How many times do we have to the, uh, toss, this, uh, toss this coin, right? So, so first of all, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, you can never really be sure if what you say is actually going to be accurate, right? Because the, the coin the can be very heavily biased towards, uh, say, uh, heads, and you might be very unlucky, and, uh, and what you see is all going to be tails, right? So like, unless the, the, the coin is always heads, or always, uh, I mean, the probability is one, one to zero, right? You can never be sure if, if your output is correct. So instead of, uh, so, so it suffices in all these problems that we correctly, then we output the correct uh, answer with, with high uh, constant uh, probability, say 90, 90% or 99%. Right? So, so for, for the upper bound, it is well known that using Hefting's inequality, that uh, 1 over epsilon square uh, samples are going to be enough. Right? So, so this is like a basic, uh, basic knowledge from, uh, uh, probability, uh, from a probability course. Right? So the so natural question is, is this bound optimal? Right? So there are, there are various, various ways you could attack this problem. Uh, like the, the first historic proof I know of this, of this uh, that answers this question, paper that answers this question, uses some combinatorial argument. Right? And the problem of the combinatorial argument is that you have to look at, uh, you know, it gets, it gets pretty complicated when you, when you have two, uh, two binomial distributions and you, and you start uh, looking at how much uh, the difference in the distri those distributions is, right? What is the DL1 distance between those two distributions? Because this, this bounds uh, the probability with which you can distinguish them. Right? So instead of that, we're going uh, to we're gonna go now over a simple uh, uh, information-based uh, proof. Right? So the following two distributions are going to be difficult to distinguish. Right? In, the, in one distribution, <coughs> And the first one is uh, the, the priority of heads is going to be 1 half minus 2 epsilon. And the priority of tails is going to be the complement of that, which is 1 half plus uh, 2 epsilon. 
right? And the other distribution is slightly biased, uh, has the same amount of bias, but in the opposite direction, right? So the priority of heads is going to be 1 half plus 2 epsilon, and the priority of tails is going to be 1 half minus 2 epsilon. Right? So, so more formally, uh, the difficult, the difficult uh, uh, instance is going to be the following, right? So the priority of heads is going to be 1 half plus delta times 2 times epsilon, where delta is going to be selected uniformly at random from uh, minus 1 plus 1. Right? So whoever tries to predict, uh, so based on, uh, like even without looking at any coin toss, right, you, you can, of course, be correct with priority 1 half right, by just answering randomly. But uh, we want to show that with, if you use a small number of samples, then you'll be very un, uh, unlikely to, to go far away from, from, uh, from one half. Right? The, uh, the probability of your success is going to be one half plus something tiny. OK, so let's suppose we, we just, uh, we just, uh, just toss the, the coin uh, once. Right? So we're going to get either heads or tails. So what's the mutual information between uh, between this coin toss and this unknown bias, right? So it's uh, so it's gonna be th uh, the the entropy of the coin toss minus the entropy of the coin toss given this hidden variable hidden bias, right? So this this is this is gonna be x if we don't know anything about delta, right? Uh, uh, the x is gonna be distributed completely uniformly at random, right? So we're going to see uh, both heads and tails with the same probability one half. Right, so the entropy of this is going to be one. So what's the entropy of this? So I'm not going to do the calculation here, uh, but uh, uh, in both cases, right, we, we get a slight bias towards either heads or tails. But overall, this bias is going to be uh, small. And like first order linear terms basically cancel each other out. And the only thing that survives is, is terms epsilon square and less, right? So, so in the end, this is going to be roughly 1 minus some constant times epsilon square. So, so if you subtract, uh, subtract this, this whole quantity from this, what is going to survive is only going to be this quadratic, uh, small quadratic uh, uh, term right? of, of order epsilon square. Suppose now that we have uh, multiple coin tosses, right? X1 through XK. So of course, uh, so using uh, what, we, what we've already learned, uh, the, the sum of mutual, intro, uh, mutual uh, uh, informations is going to be epsilon squared times K. Right? So, so now the very important question is, can we, can we show that this sum bounds uh, the mutual information between all those coin tosses, so this is not the product, this concatenation, right? The sum between uh, like all those coin tosses and uh, this hidden bias. Why is it important? Well, if, if this were true, and if k is less than 1 over epsilon square, asymptotically less than 1 over epsilon square, then, then, then the following happens, right? So first of all, because uh, if this thing holds, right, we know that the mutual that the, the entropy of of delta given all those uh, all those coin tosses is going to be uh, the entropy of, of of delta which is 1 minus the mutual information right if this mutual information is is subconstant then this is going to be 1 minus something subconstant right so again not doing any uh, any formal uh, computation, which is easy to do, but essentially this means that this delta, even given uh, our knowledge about all those coin tosses, right, our delta is going to be almost uniformly distributed on, on uh, minus 1 plus 1. Right, so, so any algorithm, so any algorithm that takes this knowledge cannot predict what delta is given, given the the coin tosses uh, with priority larger than one half plus something subconstant. Okay, so but this so this happens if this is true, right? So so now the question: What do you think? Is this true or not? So 
So let me, mo so let me move to the second slide, right? So I'm going to focus on the case uh, of k equals 2. Like the, the, uh, you're going to see that easily by, by induction, uh, k larger than, than 2 is going to follow. So what's the mutual information? So I'm going to use Venn's uh, Venn diagram. And uh, so what's the mutual information between those two coin tosses, x1, x2, and, and delta? Right? So, so it's uh, this mutual information plus this mutual information plus minus this, this quantity, which is, which is called uh, um, it's a generalization of mutual information. Right? It's, uh, in, uh, in general, it's called a multivariate mutual information. Right? So we are subtracting I, this mutual information between x1, x2, and delta. And looking at this diagram again, you can, def you can, you can express this quantity as the, as, uh, the mutual information between x1 and x2, right? So suppose that this is, this is x1, this is x2. So, so now this triangle, which is, which is this quantity, right, can be expressed as uh, the mutual information between, uh, between, uh, between x1 and x2, right, and minus minus this part, right, which is the mutual information between x1 and x2 once you know the delta. Right, so, so we would like to show that, that, this, that, this, that this quantity, this, this uh, three-way mutual information, that it's positive, right, because this is going to prove what, uh, what we were asking for in the previous slide. So the problem is that, in general, this, this quantity can be negative, right? So, so probably you can, like, if you have some uh, intuition about uh, the standard mutual information between two variables, that thing is always uh, non-negative, right? It cannot be, it cannot be negative, right? Unfortunately, for, for, uh, like when you go to those higher order generalizations, these kinds of quantities can become negative, right? One, one example, like if you have three variables, x, y, z, then uh, one example when, when this is the case, is when x, y, and z uh, uh, are such that x, uh, the xor of x and y equals z, right? Z, z equals the parity of x and y, right? So, so what happens in this case? Um, if, you, if you know something uh, about x, so let's see, if you, if, you, if you have z, right? If you have z, the, inform the mutual information between z and x is zero, right? The mutual information between z and y is zero as well, right? But suddenly, when you add up those two facts together, then uh, it turns out that in that case, right, even though those two, those two terms are zero, then, then this, this, this whole term with the minus sign in front of it is, is going to contribute, is gonna contribute uh, one. Right? So suddenly, you know, up to some point, if you, if you collect information about this hidden variable, you know nothing, but uh, altogether, at some point, those messages are going to uh, combine to some positive knowledge. So what happens in this case? So in this case, fortunately, that's not the case. Right? So, uh, so let's look at this term, the mutual information between x1 and x2 given delta. Right? So once I know delta, x1 and x2 become independent, right? And for independent variables, the mutual information is zero, right? So, so this, this term is going to become zero. Uh, so this also implies that this three-way mutual information is, is going to become uh, non-negative. And this proves that uh, this, this whole, the contribution of this term is going to be negative. In the, uh, it cannot be positive, right? So, so this means that the sum of those mutual, mutual informations bounds the mutual information between uh, two coin tosses and the, hidden, and, this, and the hidden bias, right? Good. And as I said, by induction, you can show, you can just add another message, right? You can replace x1 whenever it appears here with, with x1 through xj and x2 with xj plus 1, right? So you can just add them one by one. 
those, those coin tosses and show that uh, uh, this inequality on Misha information holds. Okay. So now let's look at uh, the, the problem of learning um, uh, a discrete distribution. Right, so, so let's look first at the, the upper bound. Uh, so the algorithm is very simple, right? You, you're gonna take n over epsilon square samples and you're just gonna output the, the empirical distribution of this set of samples. Right, so, in the, so you have the overall number of samples, say the first element appeared five times, so, so, so your output for, this for the probability of this element is gonna be five divided by, by the, number of, the total number of samples. And you're gonna do the same thing for, for every coordinate. Right, so why does this work? So you can show that for every subset, so you take a subset of, of, the, of the domain, right, and you show that uh, the probability of uh, the, uh, the probability of this uh, subset is not going to differ much between what, what, what we output and the, and the actual distribution. Right? So you can show that this number of samples is going to be at most epsilon over 2, the probability of this specific subset, with, with probability which is almost 1. The probability of error is going to be exponentially small. Right? And, and again, it follows from Hefding's uh, inequality. So by using the union bound, you can show that this, 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 uh, this bound holds for all subsets with, with probability almost one. Right? And finally, you can show that uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, if you have a bound on all subsets, that the probabilities of, in those two distributions are not very different, that this implies, at most epsilon over two, that this is equivalent to those two distributions being at distance epsilon. Right? Uh, so let's just see it in one direction, the, the direction that we're interested in. Right? Suppose that this, so if, if this thing were larger than epsilon, right, and it would have to be a subset of elements on which, uh, on which uh, uh, the, the, the difference, be, uh, one of them would have to be larger than the other one. I mean, the probability would have to be at least epsilon over two. It would have to be more than epsilon over two, and there would be a similar bias in the other direction on some other elements, right? Because, because those two things are distri probability distributions, right? So, so, so this is, so this is how, how this implies this. Okay, so what is, uh, so what is the difficult, uh, the difficult uh, instance? So it's to some extent the generalization, a generalization of what you've seen for uh, uh, for the problem of estimating the bias of a coin. Right? So, so, so our domain is 1 through n. Right? We're going to partition it into pairs. Right? Each pair, so, so if this thing were, if this distribution were uniform, then, then the probability of every element would be uh, 1 over n. Right? But we're, what we're going to do for every pair, we're going to randomly bias it either one direction or the other direction, right? So you can think of uh, having n over, two, uh, n over two coins, with each of them be being biased randomly in one or the other direction. Right, and uh, what you can now show is that uh, in order to output a good distribution, a correct distribution, Right, and if you make this, this bias sufficiently large, we put some large, uh, large constant here, then in order to, to output a correct uh, a distribution that is close to the, to the unknown distribution, you have to predict a large constant fraction of, uh, of uh, biases correct. Right, if, if you are incorrect on, if you are incorrect on uh, more than small constant fraction of them, then this is going to immediately imply that those two distributions are going to be far. Right? And you can show, it's, it's also going to follow from the, from the proof I show later, it's, to some extent you can think of it as generalization of what we've seen before, uh, you can show that this is going to require n over epsilon square samples. Okay, so 
Now I'm going to show uh, communication complexity lower bound for, for the problem we, uh, uh, we already discussed. Right, so I'm going to show that uh, no protocol that uses less than n over epsilon squared times log n communication on average uh, is, is going to succeed with, with very high constant probability. Right, so basically this means that, so the number of samples that I need is n over epsilon squared, but on top of that I, I have to communicate uh, x, an extra factor of log n. Right, and you can assume that uh, uh, there are the most this many players in the proof because if there were more and if each of them were, was actually active, then they would have to communicate, they would overall send, uh, uh, they would send, uh, the total communication would be larger than this. Okay, so I'm going to use the same, I'm going to use the same, the same hard distribution. And you can also assume that uh, the protocol is deterministic, right? So, uh, so the protocol could, could theoretically use some random bits, either private randomness or public randomness, shared by the players They would help them to arrive at uh, a good decision. And uh, I can, there, so you can show that there is, there is a, a setting of random bits in the protocol for, for, this, for this distribution, such that it's going to make only a slight loss in the probability of success. And also the, the expected communication is going to go up by, by most a constant factor. It's, it's like a routine application of, of Markov's inequality. Okay, so what's, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the plan? So we're going to assume that there is a protocol that uses very little communication. Then we're going to show that for a random i, so, so i is going to be between uh, 1 and, uh, and n over 2, right? So, uh, so it's going to be an index of one of the biases. And we're going to show that those messages that the players send are going to reveal very little about, uh, uh, about uh, this specific delta i. And that's going to happen even if the referee knows, f this is going to simplify the proof, even if the referee knows all the other delta i's, uh, the, the transcript of the protocol, the messages ex exchanged by the, by the players are going to reveal very little about this specific delta i. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Non non yeah, he, here, here the simplified proof I'm showing everything is going to be non-interactive. Right, and, and using that, we're going to show that the original protocol, right, so we are just observing the transcript of the protocol, just seeing what the messages are sent, and we're going to show that the original protocol cannot be correct on more, significantly more than half of, uh, half of those uh, biases. Right, and this, this is going to lead to contradiction. Okay, let's, uh, so let's see the messages of a single player, right? So, so this, is, uh, uh, this, is, this is like this simple, simultaneous communication setting where everyone independently sends uh, a message to the, to, the, to the referee, right? So, uh, so this is going to slightly simplify the proof. Uh, so, so for each bias, let's say J, we have to get specific bias J, right? We're going to have... Um, uh, so, so there are two, two corresponding uh, elements in the domain, in the support to this, to this bias, right? We're, we're going to modify the protocol in, in the following way. So, so initially, our protocol is going to send some message x for 2j minus 1, and it's going to send some, some message y for 2j, right? For, for those two, two corresponding elements. So we're going to make it symmetric by making the player send the message x, y if it's this element and the message y, x if it's the other element. Right? So it's going to make uh, the proof slightly nicer because now we're going to know that every message is just going to correspond to some subset of, of, of pairs and it's going to show whether the, uh, the bias goes one way or the other. Right? So, so this is going to make uh, things slightly, slightly simpler. And uh, how does this impact our protocol? Well, so the communication complexity is going to double at most. And this is going to, as I said already, this is going to partition the pairs, right? So that every message is going to 
show a bias on a specific subset of, of pairs. Now we're going to have uh, uh, three cases that we're going to look, right? So, so we are interested uh, in a specific, in a bias of, a, in a specific bias delta i, right? So, so there are going to be three cases that can happen for, for this uh, specific i. So the message, the pair of messages corresponding to this i could be very long for, for a given player, right? It could be more than log n over 100, but since our uh, protocol is going to send uh, overall use very little communication on average, this is, this is, this is not going to happen for a large fraction of players. Right? So this is gonna, only going to happen for a small fraction of players. And in this case, you can assume that this message is going to explicitly say uh, what the sample this specific player has is. Right? So in this case, the mutual information between the message and uh, this hidden bias is, is, of course, bounded by the mutual information between the sample and this bias. So overall, like if we just have a coin toss, right, like the, the mutual information is, is uh, epsilon square, right? But here it's going to be epsilon square divided by n because uh, only with priority 1 over uh, 2 over n, this, uh, this, this specific message is going to be sent, right? So most of the time, like this, this given player will have no information about this specific bias that, that, we, that we are interested in. Right? Like most, most players, want, because every player has just one sample, most of the time a given player will have no information for us. Even though the protocol that this, that this uh, ha uh, the way this player constructs messages would be very useful for us if this player were had uh, uh, had the, a, uh, a sample from from the pair that we are really interested in. So, th so this is where this this uh, this is why we divide by by uh, a factor of n. Another case is when this message, uh, when the message is corresponding uh, to this pair we are interested in, are short, and at the same time the number of pairs for which this, this pair of messages uh, is sent is, uh, is small, right? So once again, this is not going to uh, be happening too often, right? Because uh, the, the, the number of different messages of this length is, is at most n to the uh, uh, point zero 0.01, right? And if there is, uh, there is only root n pairs, uh, biases for, for, for which uh, this pair of messages uh, is sent, then uh, overall we have n messages, right? So the probability that this happens is going to be uh, this much, right? It's like going to be polynomially small. Right? And once again, we can assume without loss of generality that this message is going to reveal, reveal what the sample is. And the mutual information between the message and the, and the uh, and, um, and this hidden bias is going to be also of the same form. So, so what's the last case? So the last case is, uh, is the case why, why this, this whole thing is going to work, because otherwise we, we, we learn everything, right? Uh, so, so this is going to happen when the message is short, and there are lots of other pairs for which the same, the same pair of messages uh, can be sent. Right? So this can happen always. And the idea is that now this delta i is going to have very little impact on, uh, on uh, the probability with which x, y is sent and the probability with which y, y, y x is sent. Right? So, so now the mutual information between, uh, between the sample and delta i, this should be between the message and delta i, is, is going to be uh, at most epsilon squared divided by n divided by the number of pairs. Right, why, why is this the case? Uh, so it's not here, but let me uh, sit here. So basically, you can, uh, so the probability that, that this pair of messages is sent is going to be the number of pairs divided by n, n over 2, right, really. And this is going to be multiplied by how much, uh, how much we learn from, uh, from 
uh, from the message, right? Like whether it's x, y versus y, x, right? And uh, the mutual information in that case, if, if, if we condition on the case of this, this uh, one of those messages happening, is going to be, uh, so, so for the bias epsilon, the information was epsilon square, and this time the bias is going to be epsilon divided by the number of pairs squared, right? So this is going to disappear, and this is going to uh, become the number of pairs, and this, this is where this equation there comes, roughly. Okay. Uh, so the total information about uh, what is the total information I can get out of those two cases about delta i, right? So m j is the message of the JF player. M is the total uh, is, is is the total transcript is all the messages of all the players, right? And I can show that for all but a small fraction of of i's, uh, the sum of uh, uh, mutual information between delta delta i and uh, and j and m j the message of the j player right if I sum over everything uh, so these are the three cases we've seen before you you get uh, from that that the total sum of those mutual informations is is sub constant right so using the same the same trick we used for uh, for estimating the bias of a single coin Right, the messages m j are independent once delta i, del, del, uh, delta i is fixed, right? So, so, so this implies that the mutual information between delta i and all the messages is gonna be upper bounded by this sum, right? So again, this is gonna imply that the uh, the entropy of this hidden bias is gonna uh, still be very close to one. So the algorithm is gonna be very unlikely to. Uh, to correctly predict this, this specific bias, right? And uh, and this is this is gonna happen for, for a random random i. So so for most i's, the the algorithm is gonna be very unlikely to, to get far away from one half. Okay, so so I'm not gonna uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna go. Uh, mm, uh, much deeper with this, but basically you can show that this 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 lower bound still holds if uh, if the number of uh, samples per machine is bounded away from n by a polynomial factor, right? And there is like a, a more uh, specific equation that you can write, but basically you have to keep in fact uh, keep in mind that this is not gonna hold uh, uh, for very large number of samples, right? Because you can do the following things. First, you can, you can sort the samples, right? A specific machine can sort the samples, this machine received, right? And uh, what we show here, that you have to com communicate really what the sample is, like which, which, which biased pair it is about. But if you have sufficiently many samples, the number of samples is, is close to n, then the average distance between the samples is gonna become small. Right, so you just you don't have to send uh, the index of of each sample independently. It suffices that you send the distance to the next sample after sorting them. Right, so so as n grows, this this factor is going to slowly disappear. It's going to become smaller and smaller. And also the uh, the like uh, at some point you're also going to start receiving collisions. Right, the more collisions you see, this means you can you can you can compress the samples. Right, you don't have to send uh, the information about uh, each sample independently again, but since you have multiple uh, samples uh, from sample, multiple identical samples, it just suffices to, to send their number, right? So, so instead of uh, so you can uh, send the log log of their number as opposed to their number. Uh, so let me also mention that you know the, the same techniques can be can be used for uh, one problem, which is. Uh, uh, which is popular in uh, distribution testing. Uh, it's, it's, I think, is the most uh, basic uh, problem people are interested in. So, uh, so you have uh, an unknown distribution, and you want to see if um, if it's uniform, right? So, so you get independent samples from this distribution, and you want to distinguish the case 
that the distribution is uniform from the case when it's uh, far from being uniform in, uh, in the L1 distance. Right, so it's known that the sample complexity of, of this problem is, is root n over epsilon square. And I'm not going to go into details here, but uh, basically you can show that uh, if the lengths of all the messages are small, then using the methods uh, method presented here, you are, you are, you are uh, going to be likely to learn only a very small fraction of the samples. For the other samples, you're just going to know they're going to be uh, distributed over some subsets. And for those samples that you learn, you're going to be unlikely to see a collision. Right? So basically, everything you're going to see is, is just going to be random elements. So uh, this, 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 uh, this follows roughly from like, the difficult distributions for, for, for this problem, which are uh, uh, you have to distinguish something that is uniform over, over a random subset of size half versus something that is uniform over the entire domain. So I'm not going to go into details here, but, but uh, it's also possible to show using more or less the same techniques that uh, building on the same set of techniques that, that this is, uh, uh, this, this, this amount of uh, communication is not enough. Right, so, uh, so in this talk, I, I showed uh, communication lower bounds for, for learning uh, uh, discrete distributions. Right? And in this specific case, at least, the, the, the players essentially have to transmit their sample. There is like, no way to, to do it uh, with significantly sublinear uh, communication. Right? And, and the longer goal of this, of this uh, uh, research is to reinterpret known uh, distribution testing and uh, learning uh, results in this, in this communication uh, framework. And the hope is also to design some non-trivial uh, protocols uh, that uh, use a sublinear amount of communication for some other problems. <laughs>